Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi, thank you for spending some time here with me today. This week's episode is being sponsored by Bubba and Renee Berry in memory of their son, Ian. Here's what Renee has to share with us. Ian Robert Rodriguez was born on February 26, 1987, and was the second oldest of four boys. Ian had such personality ever since he was little, and he had so much compassion for others. Ian's smile was never ending, and he always wanted to make people laugh. His grandma would say Ian was a ray of sunshine. He loved music, learning to play the guitar at nine years of age, and loved to sing and dance. He decided to be a diesel technician, which we thought was a perfect career for him, since Ian loved to take things apart since he was little, even if they were brand new. Ian graduated from school, worked for a few companies, and then started his own company that he was so passionate about. He was also good at restoring old cars, which we believe if he was still here, he would have made a name for himself doing that. Ian's greatest love was the Lord, second, his three children. October 10th of 2020 was the darkest day in my life when Ian died. We were so devastated. I lost my son and a best friend. I would have fallen to the wayside, but I have survived because of my personal Savior, my God, my husband, my boys and grandkids, and GPS Hope. I know I will see Ian again because of Jesus. Thank you, Bubba and Renee, for sponsoring today's episode in honor of your son, Ian. Today's episode is going to be a bit different. I know there are a lot of regular listeners who know my story of how my daughter Becca died, but I also know there are even more listeners who don't know the story. But even if you do know the story, there are literally only a handful of you out there that know the full story because there are so many pieces to it because of its depth and because my heart is to hear your story and to minister to others in the depth of their loss. And for some reason, as I was praying about this episode, I felt a strong urge to tell mine and Rebecca's story. And I came up with reasons not to, and even why a different time would make more sense, like around her birthday or her death date. But this urge just didn't leave me. So that's what I'm going to do today. Now, I don't have a script. I'm just going to share from my heart Becca's story. So here we go. First of all, let me say that Becca was born out of wedlock. I did get pregnant my summer out of high school. My boyfriend broke up with me during that pregnancy. I had to give scholarships back that I had for college. I was going to major in music, and I wanted to be a teacher, and I was going to go to Northwestern Christian College. I had been accepted there. I had over $1,000 worth of scholarships from my school, and I had to give all those back because I was not going to be a Christian girl going to a Christian college being pregnant, right? So I continued working at Arby's, which is where I was working during high school. Now, I was a PK, a preacher's kid, for several years, and I struggle with the shame of being a good Christian girl who got pregnant. Now, the church I was attending, they didn't judge me. They even threw me a baby shower, but I had felt for quite a while that it just wasn't meeting my needs spiritually. I had become part of a high school youth group that just flourished a relationship with the Lord in a way that my church never had done. But I didn't know how to find another church that had what I was looking for. What do you do, open the yellow pages? I didn't know how to look for a church. I'd grown up in in the Church of Christ. So at that time, there was someone else who was also working at Arby's, and he was working his way through college. And one day while we were working backline together, he invited me to his church and I went to a weeknight service and I knew immediately that this is what I was looking for and that I needed to connect with that fellowship. A little bit after that, one night after an employee meeting at Arby's, this young man and I stayed until the store closed and we helped them close the store and then we stood out in the parking lot still talking about anything and everything. And we did get into some pretty deep stuff even that night. 
about what we thought our futures were going to look like. I thought that my baby's dad was going to come back into my life. He had someone of interest in his life. We were talking about all of that stuff. And we started spending time together as friends. We ended up in some ministry groups together at the church. It was a small church, so we spent time together there. We went to Perkins Restaurant a lot with little Becca in a high chair. as We just spent a lot of time talking. And by now, you've probably figured out it was Dave. And our friendship did grow into love. We got married when Becca turned two, and he adopted her as his own daughter before the end of the year was even finished. And I'll just put in a little side note. I have wanted to talk about adoptive parents who lose a child as a topic of a podcast episode sometime, and I'm hoping to get to that sometime this year. Now, we got married when Becca had just turned two in the spring in April, and the following year in the fall when she was three years old, so we had barely been married a year, uh, she was diagnosed with what's called osteogenic sarcoma or bone cancer. At that time, she had her little left leg amputated as a three-year-old because the tumor had taken over the bone, and she went through nine months of chemotherapy. She was uh, the only survivor of the original 14 children in her ward. That's something that I didn't remember, but Dave remembers very vividly. And unknown at that time, one of the chemo drugs that they were using and giving children then one of the long-term effects was heart damage. And so we found this out, uh, like I said, it was long-term. And so we found this out when Becca was like around 12 or 13, we had her tested and she did have moderate heart damage that they were keeping an eye on. Becca got married at uh, 19, very young, and uh, she got pregnant in that first year of marriage. And so pregnancy is hard on the heart. And it greatly weakened her already damaged heart. And at about four months into her pregnancy, she was checked into a hospital. And she literally lived in the hospital. They needed her there in, to have immediate access to emergency equipment in case she went into heart failure. So they could help her get the baby out fast. They had uh, all emergency equipment right in her room with an incubator. They also had an operating surgery room ready for her in case they could wheel her down to the surgery room. And she needed special drugs and special things that they had in place in case they needed it right away. Now, around 34 weeks of her pregnant into her pregnancy, which is about six weeks early, the doctors were concerned that her heart wasn't going to be able to continue supporting her and the baby. She did code once, her heart quit once, they got it started again. So the decision was made to get the baby out. Now it was interesting, it ended up being a two-day process because of the heart issues. The team of doctors that she had, they couldn't decide whether she should have a cesarean or have the baby vaginally because either way put a different uh, set of pressures and issues for the heart. And so she decided that she wanted to try first on her own. So they decided to let her, but she couldn't push and she couldn't feel any pain. <laughs> right. So anyway, that first day, nothing was really happening. And so they stopped everything and decided the next day they were going to go ahead and do the C-section. They left her hooked up in the surgery room to all of her equipment. They said it was because they didn't want to have to mess. I mean, I think they said it was like 20 pounds of tubes and needles and things coming out of her for this, and they didn't want to unhook and rehook everything. I think part of it was probably because of the situation with her heart, and they just left her hooked up on the surgery table. That's where she slept. They did let us go in and see her and pray with her and just love on her a little bit. Now, the labor and the delivery, she was only given a 50-50 chance of surviving all of this, no matter what way she had the baby. And the greatest concern, the most uh, dangerous time was after she had the baby because a woman's heart has to work extra hard to deal with all the extra fluids and the fact there's not a baby there anymore, and so it has to regulate itself. And so after a rocky 48 hours or so, uh, we were blessed to have both Becca and our little granddaughter survive because we just, we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. She fought to come home on their anniversary. 
Like I said, she got pregnant right away in that first year that they were married. And so she fought and fought. They weren't going to let her out of the hospital, but they finally dismissed her. And they got home at like, I don't know, it was something like ridiculous, like nine o'clock at night. And they both fell exhausted into their beds. But Becca was bound and determined she was not going to be in the hospital the whole time on their first anniversary. Uh, The baby stayed up there. After a while, she was able to be relocated to our local hospital because uh, we were Becca's hospital was in Madison, about an hour away from where we lived. So for a while, doctors were able to manage her heart then through medication. She did have, three years later, she was sent to the Mayo Clinic for open heart surgery. They didn't know if they were going to have to replace a valve in her heart or repair it. They were able to repair it, and she eventually came back home again. And her heart issues were able to be managed through medication. Now, in April of 2010, Dave and I were on a ministry trip in Africa. I don't know if you know, I used to be an international children's minister, and I did a lot of international travel. Dave was finally able to join me over in Africa. I was in Kenya, Uganda, and in Tanzania. And so while we were in literally in the bush of Tanzania, they have cell phones everywhere in Africa. It's crazy. We got a call telling us to get home right away because Becca needed immediate heart surgery. And so we cut our trip short. We flew home. We found out that she was refusing surgery until we came home. And what they needed to do is she was to the point where she needed to be put on the heart transplant list. But in doing all the testing, she wasn't healthy enough to be put on the transplant list. Plus, they discovered that she had cancer in her stump. After, you know, the amputation, she had one leg and the other, her left leg was a stump. Now, it was a different kind of cancer. It was a very slow, non-aggressive cancer. And so the oncology team said, yes, go ahead and deal with the heart first. We'll deal with the cancer after you get the heart issue taken care of. What they wanted to do and needed to do, since she wasn't healthy enough for a transplant, is she had what's called a VAD put in her, stands for ventricular assist device. And what it is, it's a pump that they put inside her to keep her heart going, the left side of her heart going. So um, they opened her up, put in this six pound pump, and uh, she didn't have a, a normal blood pressure at that point because the pump was just a constant flow of, of blood to the heart. So this, this pump would keep her heart going while they dealt with some of these other health issues she had to get her to where she could be put on the transplant list. She got this pump on her 28th birthday. I know the surgeon, she asked, can I not get it on that day? That's my birthday. And the uh, surgeon said, eat cake on Monday. So that's what we did. We took up birthday presents and a cake to her in the hospital the night before the surgery and celebrated her 28th birthday. It was a 10 hour surgery. And having the VAD meant she had a drive line coming out of her abdomen that it was attached to the pump on the inside, and on the outside it was attached to a small computer that was strapped around her waist. That computer was run by two battery packs, so she had this belt that had this computer and a couple of battery packs. At night, we would have to unplug one battery at a time. We'd plug her into a wall unit, so she was plugged in at night. And it would kind of evaluate her heart and run some numbers. This computer would, this thing she was plugged into at night would do all that. It had to be changed every day. We had double gloves, masks. The procedure, because obviously it went straight to her heart, so any kind of an infection would have been severely dangerous and life-threatening to her. So when she left the hospital from this surgery, everywhere she went, she had to take a VAD bag And it was a little black bag that we carried everywhere she went, and it had spare batteries in it, and it had a spare computer in it in case anything malfunctioned. And three of us, her husband and my other daughter and I, were trained on the equipment before we left the hospital. And we knew that if any of these alarms went off and we knew what alarm meant what, that we only had five minutes to fix the problem if one of those alarms went off. Fortunately, we never had that issue so, and obviously she had to have batteries full, fully charged all the time and, you know, switching them out and all that stuff. It was, it was quite the event. Had to be covered whenever she got washed up or showered or anything. Obviously, it changed the quality of her life drastically. Within a week of getting home from the VAD surgery, 
she had to have someone with her 24-7 for the first beginning section uh, because they were dealing with blood thinners and all kinds of stuff. It was obviously a dangerous situation, and so they had to have someone with her all the time until they figured out how her heart was going to handle this VAD and the blood thinners and all that. So anyway, my daughter was with her, and we had to call an ambulance for her. They ended up uh, sending a helicopter for her, and it turned out that she had had a stroke. And so the stroke took most of the mobility of her left arm and her hand, which left her needing a motorized wheelchair with this equipment because, uh, yeah, anyway, and a neighbor gave one to her. I happened to have an extra one, one they weren't using. And so uh, within the next year, she literally had a good dozen ambulance rides. Some of those I was with her. And almost two-thirds of the year was literally spent in the hospital because anything sent her back to the hospital with this heart pump. Even getting her wisdom teeth pulled had to be done at Madison University Hospital because of the blood thinners that were involved. They had to stop the thinners, and then they had to get them going immediately afterwards uh, because of this pump in her. They didn't want it throwing a blood clot which is probably what happened with that stroke at the beginning. And so obviously the risk of anything going on in her life was very high. With heart issues, you take on water weight, and she would take all these LASIK pills, and she would get to the point where she couldn't take enough pills. She was like 17 pills at a time. So they would have to admit her and give her IV LASIKs, get all this water weight off again. It, it was just a crazy year. Most of the holidays and birthdays, she was up in the hospital for Easter that year. Uh, you know, hospitals tend to try to clear out as many patients as they can over major holidays. And so Easter was one of those, and the Madison University Hospital cafeteria was closed. And they gave us permission. We took up Easter dinner, all of our family, her siblings, and the family went up for Easter dinner. And they gave us the dining area that the doctors and the staff eat in down by the cafeteria. And so we had dinner there, and we actually had an Easter egg hunt in the, in the cafeteria at uh, Madison University Hospital. I had the Easter baskets and Easter eggs all over the place because it was closed, and we wanted uh, her daughter, who was nine at the time. I guess she was eight at that point. And then Becca had a niece at that point, and so uh, we had fun up there. She was in the hospital for Mother's Day. She was just there more than she was home. And exactly a year and a day after getting the heart pump, we had a big birthday party for her at home when she turned 29, big luau party. And the next day, it was just the most bizarre thing. Somehow her drive line that was connected to the battery packs was was left out. It wasn't taped down to her like it should have been. And the drive line, she was in her electric wheelchair and she was going around to the backyard and the drive line caught on the chain link fence and it sliced part of the wire and it caused the pump to be shorting in and out. And it was jolting her like seizures, which was horrible. And so uh, the ambulance got her to the hospital, and then once again, a helicopter came to pick her up. And at that point, they opened her up. They couldn't repair the drive line with the sliced wire, and they ended up removing the pump. Uh, her left, The left side of her heart, since the pump had been doing the work, that side of her heart was getting stronger, but the right side was getting weaker. And because of her immobility issues with the stroke and the wheelchair and only having one leg, the equipment they would have had to have given her to have a pump to run both sides of her heart was just very impractical. So uh, they just closed her back up and left the pump out. At that point, she had actually, like I said, her quality of life had diminished so much that she had actually been making a list of pros and cons about maybe even having them take the pump out and just living out whatever life she had so that she could drive again, swim, you know, spend qu more quality time with her daughter, that kind of a thing with her family. Uh, for Christmas, they did a family trip to Chicago that year because I think she had a feeling it was her last Christmas with her family, with her husband and her daughter. So, yeah, so they removed the pump. And four months later, she was in her van with her husband and her daughter, and she had SCD, sudden cardiac death. She just slumped over along with a brain seizure. Now, when she had the pump, any kind of emergency, if she would to have something like that, 
And one reason she couldn't really recover from her stroke was because of the pump inside her. They couldn't use certain equipment. Anything that would cause like a static electricity, they couldn't jumpstart her heart, you know, those kinds of things. But because the pump had been removed, they actually were miraculously, the, the EMTs were able to revive her and restart her heart. So they put her on ice. She was in, a, in an induced coma. Well, actually, when I think about it, I don't know if it was induced or not, but she didn't really wake up from that. She was put on ice at the local hospital, and they sent the helicopter again. So she had her third med flight ride to UW Hospital. She did spend a week in the cardiac ICU and another week beyond that in the hospital in the heart unit recovering. And the trauma had affected her brain a bit, causing some memory loss and some fuzzy thinking from that point on. It's kind of funny because our family talks about when we saw the helicopter coming in and the, you know, the, the helicopter EMT people come in, there was just such a relief for us because we knew she was in good hands then. She did recover from that, but a month later, she was admitted back into University Hospital. Actually, she was getting some outpatient Lasix, but things were not right. And Becca would always, she was one of those that would manage her own medications to a point, and they let her because she knew her body and kind of what was going on. And if she knew something wasn't right and like 4th of July weekend or a family get together or whatever, she refused to go back to Madison to get checked out until that event was over because it was almost always a sure bet she would be checked back into the hospital. So it was one of those things, but she asked while we were there and she was getting a LASIK treatment to see her doctor. Now, she asked to see her doctor. I knew it was bad. And so they basically took one look at her and said, we have to admit you again. They weren't sure exactly what was going on, had to figure it out. And she started kind of having these hallucination things, which she had never had before, just really strange things she was saying and seeing and getting agitated. And so I got the nurse in there, and pretty soon there were all these doctors and people in white coats. Now, white coats didn't intimidate me at all because Madison University Hospital, it's a university hospital where they train doctors. And so their interns always coming and going. And and I was used to, when Becca had her chemo, of white coats everywhere, you know, a room filled with white coats. When she had her stroke, it was kind of funny because her husband and I drove up there. And when we got to her heart unit, I saw, we didn't know where she was. We just knew she'd be in the heart unit. So we got up there and I saw this big group. I mean, a room where there were all these people in white coats that couldn't even all fit into the room. They were out in the hallway. And it was like, that's where she is. I knew that's where she was. And so I just walked up and I said, excuse me, I'm the mom, excuse me, I'm the mom. And I, they all just parted. I mean, like I said, I wasn't intimidated by them at all because of uh, when she was little. And her husband just kind of had this funny look on his face and he was like, I'm with her. And he's like six foot six. He's really tall. I'm very short. I'm five foot. So anyway, like I said, these, these white coats didn't intimidate me. But there were all these doctors that I had never seen before. I mean, we knew the entire staff by them. We were free to come and go when she was in the heart ICU unit. We knew everybody. And these were people I'd never seen before. And I wasn't hearing what was going on. All I knew was they were looking for a bed in what they called TLC. And all of a sudden, there was one other patient that wanted the one bed that was left. And all of a sudden, they said, we got the bed. And she was gone. I mean, just like that. She was gone. And it was almost like you see in the in like a a cartoon with papers flying, you know, that kind of a thing. It was just, they just whisked her out of there. And I had her wheelchair. And so a nurse told me she would take me to where Becca was. And it was on a way far end of the hospital that we had not been in before. And TLC stood for Trauma Life Center. And so it is where they take the worst of the worst victims, crash victims, burn victims, emergency, that kind of a thing. We'd never been there before. I couldn't go back there. I was in a waiting room with a phone. I was there pretty much through the night. I finally called at, I don't know, 4 or 6 in the morning and said, I'm her mom. I've been here all night. Nobody's telling me what's going on. Can somebody please talk to me? And when I had taken the wheelchair in there, she was just screaming bloody murder to everybody to leave her alone. And I guess they were trying to get a, a, a pick in. And so anyway, that's, and I just kind of left the the wheelchair outside of the curtained room and went back out to the waiting room. So when I called back, they said, well, you caught us at a good time. You can come back now and someone will talk to you. And I went back and she was like this total vegetable. She was hooked up to more machines than I had ever seen her hooked up to, even after she'd had three heart surgeries by that time. 
and someone told me she had gotten sepsis, septicemia, which is uh, blood poisoning. Somehow an infection had gotten into her blood, all of her organs were shutting down, and so everything was being run by equipment, kidney, liver, you know, breathing, all of that. And so obviously they did not expect her to pull through with the heart, the weakened heart that she had. Uh, her heart doctors came down pretty much to see her a final time, that kind of a thing. And the amazing thing is she recovered. She actually pulled out of that. She was in there for her 10th anniversary. They were supposed to get her out of the TLC into her heart unit that day, and they weren't quite able to get her a bed in the heart unit. We got her and her husband a little piece of cake from the downstairs cafeteria. I got some balloons for her room and, and some flowers, and so they let us use a little conference room and and they had just a little anniversary time together. She was so out of it, though. So anyway, the next day, they got her back into her heart unit, and she did recover. Now, this girl, uh, I think you can tell by now that miracle after miracle after miracle had happened in her life to spare her over and over and over again. And I really felt like God was either going to give her a new heart, uh, miraculously heal her heart, something. She was going to be whole and healed. I just fully believe that with everything in me. Because she had just survived so many things she should not have survived through her life already at 29 years old. And so uh, she got dismissed. I went off on a, a trip in to North Dakota, and she ended up back in the hospital for her normal LASIK, you know, routine overload of getting fluids off. And a lot of you have heard me say this, that I told her I would fly back. She would ask me, when are you coming home? I'd say, Wednesday. And I'd say, do you want me to come home early? Nope, that's that's fine. You, ju you just stay there. And then I would talk to her again. When are you going to be home? On Wednesday. Do you want me to come home early? No, that's fine. So I did fly home on Wednesday. I went straight to the hospital. I don't normally fly into the Madison airport, because, but because I'd been doing so much traveling, I had some frequent flyer miles, and it's a more convenient but a more expensive airport for us. So I had used the Madison airport for that trip. So I, I flew in. My other daughter picked me up. We went straight to the hospital. I visited her. Looking back, I can see some things that I didn't see at that moment. So I spent maybe an hour or so with her. I went home. I don't even think I unpacked my bags. I, I fixed supper for the family. And I just had something just told me I needed to get back up there. And so my daughter got in the car with me, and we were on our way up there. And it literally was a dark and stormy night. And her husband called and said she had coded, that her heart stopped, and they were trying to get her back. And so I'm driving. This is like an hour trip. Like I said, dark and raining. And he called again, and he said, the doctors want to know how long uh, I want them to keep working on her. And I said, well, what are they saying? And he just answered, and he said, I'll tell them to keep keep trying. And then he called back the third time and said, she's gone. So instead of seeing her, I went up to see her body. The thing was, she was supposed to be dismissed the next day with a new piece of equipment that they were going to try and we were going to be trained on it the next morning before she got dismissed. But I guess she got even a better dismissal <laughs> because she left this earth to receive her complete healing, including to be able to uh, dance with Jesus on two legs that she hadn't had since she'd been three years old. So that is the main parts of Becca's story. It is shared, a lot of what I just shared is on the website on Becca's story. You can see some pictures there if you're interested. And I did write even more about it in my book, When Tragedy Strikes, Rebuilding Your Life with Hope and Healing After the Death of Your Child. This wasn't going to be a plug for the book, but I just happened to remember that. When Becca was diagnosed with cancer at only three years old, I had what I call a presumptuous faith. I was in the belief system, I guess I'll call it, is that you can declare a thing and it will happen. If it's in God's word, uh, you have enough faith, then you will make it happen. There's no sickness and healing. We're supposed to be bringing heaven down to earth, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If there's no sickness in heaven, we're supposed to be bringing down healing. And, you know, if you have enough faith, you can do this. And, and I, I did. I had a very presumptuous faith. I really believe that if I told enough people, 
that Becca was going to be healed. She wasn't going to have to have her leg amputated. She wasn't going to have to finish out the chemo, that she would be healed. I really, I really believed that. And so I was stunned when, and, and I was really scared that they were going to amputate her leg. And, oh, I didn't even tell this part of the story. She was diagnosed on September 5th, which was my due date with mine and Dave's first child. And so she was diagnosed on my due date. I went 10 days overdue. She was going, Becca was going to be dismissed from the hospital the morning I went into labor. Dave, we lived in Janesville. His wife and his daughter were up in Madison, and he worked in a town, and it made a triangle. You had to go through one to get to the other. And so he'd get off work at night. Do I go home? Do I go up to the hospital? What do I do? He's got a nine-month overdue pregnant wife. And so and that weekend, they allowed both of us to sleep in the room with Becca. And because she was only three and because of our situation, my water broke. And so we took off because, believe it or not, they don't deliver babies in Mad- at that hospital, University Hospital in Madison. There are other hospitals that do in Madison. But Becca was getting dismissed that day for the first time. She had had all of the tests. They had done a, a they had taken a, a chunk of her bone to test it. And she was going to be dismissed that day, and she had already started her first round of chemo. They started it immediately, and so she'd been in the hospital for over a week, and she was going to get out that day. Well, I wasn't going to be stuck in Madison having a baby, right, (laughs) when she was going to be home for a few days until she could have her second round of chemo. So Dave and I took off for Janesville for the hospital, and we pulled in, and I was in very heavy labor. I could tell he was this baby was coming fast and hard. And I told Dave, if you don't start running red lights, you might as well find a hospital here in, here in, in Madison. So he whipped it, you know, 80 miles an hour, no cops to escort him, of course. <laughs> so we got to our hospital in Janesville. They got me up there. I didn't even realize I'd not asked for an epidural. I asked if it was too late for one. They said they had already called it anesthesis, which it didn't dawn on me. Why would you call one if I haven't asked for an epidural? Well, what had happened was they realized the baby was breech. He was a double-footed breech. He was coming out feet first instead of head first, so they were preparing for an emergency C-section. Well, he started coming out. The foot was coming out. And so at that point, there was nothing they could do. And so I had to have the baby vaginally with this uh, double-footed breech, which can be very dangerous. And I had no painkillers, nothing to help me. And I felt like the doctor just had both hands up there trying to yank the baby out. I didn't know any of this. I did not know any of this at this point. And after he was born, I felt like I was going to throw up. I was just nauseous, lightheaded, in so much pain. And we found out the next day from a friend who was a nurse that we came within seconds of losing both me and this baby, our our oldest son. And because he was stuck, he ended up being eight pounds, it was 10 or 12 ounces. He ended up being a big boy. And because he came out feet first, it didn't open me up like I should have been opened. And he was stuck and the cord was stuck, pinching off, you know, any any oxygen and things that he needed. And we almost lost both of us that night. So Dave ended up going up to Madison, checking Becca out the the following, well, it was early morning, six o'clock. Nobody even knew I was in labor. Everything happened so fast. (laughs) And so Dave showed up at his parents' house at like six in the morning, told them I'd had the baby. Obviously, he was exhausted. So he went up to Madison, got Becca, checked her out, brought her home. And I got dismissed from the hospital, I believe, Monday morning. This was, I think, a Friday. I was dismissed Monday morning. And then all I did was go home, repack for Becca, and we went up to University Hospital because Becca was supposed to start her second round of chemo. And they actually very graciously let all four of us stay in the same room together. So our first night as a family was spent with this freshly newborn baby, Dave and I and Becca, up in her little hospital room getting her next round of chemo. And so She was diagnosed on September 5th on my due date, and all of that happened. She had her amputation exactly two months later. They started the chemo. 
for amputation was November 5th. They biopsied the tumor, found out the, the chemo drugs they were using at the time were working. It was killing off the tumor. Her leg was already destroyed from the tumor. That's why they had to amputate. And so they were able to keep going with the milder drugs. It was called methotrexate. But, you know, like some antibiotics, your body gets used to it and doesn't respond. So twice they had to hit her with something really hard kind of to confuse and shake things up, and then they could go back to the methotrexate. And it was one of those really hard drugs that they gave her that damaged her heart. So just some more information I forgot to put in there during the telling of the story. So yeah, those first seven months of my, my newborn's life, he spent most of his time with his grandpa and grandma Deal. Dave was at work during the week. I was up with my three-year-old. We weren't going to leave her alone, having cancer, going through chemo treatments and a fresh amputation. So on the weekends, if Becca was in, Dave and I would switch and I would be home with the baby and he'd be up with Becca. And it was just a, a really crazy time. And, you know, we look back at it and it's it's only the grace of God that we got through something like this. Here's another little interesting thing. Both my dad and Dave's dad decided to go together and get Becca a puppy. Now, I grew up with Shelties. I love Shelties. And they decided to get her a little Sheltie puppy. So I had a three-year-old going through chemo and an amputation, literally a newborn and a puppy. <laughs> so, so, yeah, grace of God, big time <laughs> to get through that. So back to the whole presumptuous faith thing. Yeah, I really believed that God was going to heal Becca and heal her heart because she had lived through so many things that she should not have lived through. And so I was afraid that they were going to amputate her leg and then find out when they checked to see how the chemo drugs were working that the tumor was gone and they didn't need to amputate. I mean, wouldn't that be horrible? Well, they had us come early, early before the day of the amputation to do an MRI to know exactly where to cut the leg. I, as horrible as that sounds, that's that's that was our life. That's what happened. And the tumor was there. And so I, I was devastated. It was like, what is this faith then? How much is enough? And it, it did send me on a journey. And so over the years, other things that have happened in our family, I have come to understand and realize that faith isn't getting what you want from God and you know, getting enough of the word in you and pumping yourself up enough to believe enough that God is going to do what I tell him he has to do because that's what his word says. I now understand that faith is a place of trust. It's not a place of strong-arming God and believing that he's going to do this and he's going to do that, but it's it's coming from a place of trust. Having faith is believing in and holding on tightly to what you cannot see. Like Hebrews 11, 1 says, while you are building your trust with him and growing your relationship with the one who can see, Faith is the evidence of things I cannot see. It is the evidence of knowing that I can trust God with the outcome, no matter what that is, knowing that he has the final word. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He has everything I need to get through whatever that circumstance is. I trust him. I have faith for it to get me through it and to come out on the other side, not just as a different person, but somehow, in a miraculous way, a better person. And only God can do something like that. And let me just say that when we come out of the other side of this, of this suffocating darkness and the pain that we just don't think we can take anymore, we come out as a, a different person, but a better person in ways that we can actually uh, are tangible in our lives that we can say, I'm better now because I'm now, you know, less judgmental. I have more compassion. I have a strength that I didn't have before. You know, those kinds of things. And it's it's not because of your child's death, okay? This can happen in our lives because of your child's life, not because of their death and being stuck in their death, but because of your child's life and because of the life and the death of Jesus and the fullness of what that did for all of us. I, I hope the story just built up your faith that and your hope and, and just puts you in a place where, wow, if Laura could go through all of that, and come out the way she has, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there is hope for me. And there is, let me just tell you, there is. 
Now, after Becca died, she died in October, and in December, I actually went on a five-night cruise by myself, and it turned out to be a wonderful thing. And I, when we started uh, this ministry of GPS Hope, I wanted to find a way to get other parents, other bereavers, parents who are bereaved of their child, I wanted to find a way to get them on a cruise because it was so wonderful for me. And I was only two months into my grief. And God has done that. So I want to make sure that you know exactly one year from today, if you're listening to this when it comes out in February, the last week of February, you could be in the Caribbean with Dave and me on a seven night cruise. Join us on board as we set sail for a voyage like no other. The Grief Cruise offers a safe haven for those who have faced a deep loss, providing support, understanding, and a chance to connect with others who truly understand what you're going through. And we know how important that is as bereaved parents. Now, we have reserved cabins. There are great balcony cabins in a really good location on the ship. And best of all, our group pricing is $1,000 less than the going price for the same ship and cabin, which is Royal Caribbean's five-star Reader's Choice Award ship, Symphony of the Seas. Now, the Grief Cruise activities include daily workshops with incredible and educational grief presenters. Just to note, there will be a few sessions done by myself, specifically for parents who've lost a child. There are small group circles of hope specific to the type of loss, like the loss of a child, loss of a spouse, loss of a parent, because the grief cruise is for any deep loss, but we have special things for those who have lost a child. There's also a candlelit walk, a night of remembrance to honor our loved ones, and group dinners in a reserved section of the dining room. There's just so much to this. Plus the live entertainment, the shore excursions, incredible food of this five-star cruise. And all you have to do is board the ship. Everything else is taken care of you for an entire week. No cooking, no cleaning, beautiful sunsets, great companionship. Like I said, all you have to do is pack and show up. So whether you're seeking support and understanding or looking for some tools to help you on this unwanted journey of child loss, or you just need to get away for a while or all of the above, the Grief Cruise is for you. To find out more, go to gpshope.org slash cruise. You'll find things there like the cost of the various cabins, some photos, a video of a previous Grief Cruise, the ship's itinerary. You'll also see a request information button, which will connect you with Lynn Finley, who is both the coordinator of the seminar and the travel agent you have to book through to get the cabin price and to be part of these special sessions and events. And just a note, Lynn has lost a daughter, so she's one of us. Oh, and one other small bit of information. I will be celebrating my birthday and becoming an official senior citizen while on board. So consider this as an official invitation to my birthday party next year. GPS Hope is here to be your guiding light as you navigate the waters of grief. Together, we'll find our way back to hope. And one very special way to do that is to join us in February of 2025 on the Grief Cruise. Let's go ahead and go on to this week's birthday segment. Ian Rodriguez was born on February 26th and is forever 33. Dylan Paul Yancey Clark was born on February 26th and is forever 17. Maisha Grimes was born on March 1st and is forever 24. We celebrate the day these children came into the world. We know it will always be a special day. If you would like to have your child's birthday announced the week of his or her birthday, I would love to be able to do that for you. Just go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. Fill out the information, submit it, and I will announce your child the week of his or her birthday. And Dave will also send you an email to remind you to listen. I want to say thank you again to Bubba and Renee Berry for sponsoring today's podcast episode in honor and memory of their son, Ian. If you would like to sponsor a podcast in honor of your child, you can pick the date. And it's only a $50 sponsorship. Just go to gpshope.org, go to the Donate tab, and hover over that. You'll see a place where it says Sponsor a Podcast Episode. Click on that, and you'll have all the information right there. 
So after sharing all of that about Becca's story, I can honestly say, and I think you can tell, that I do believe with all my heart that God is good and he is a faithful God. And some of you may be wondering, how can I possibly say that? Because love does not manipulate and it can't be manipulated. And when you know someone is trying to manipulate you or intimidate you or just plain bully and dominate you to do what they think you should do, how loved do you feel? Even if they have good intentions, it isn't really love, is it? Now, I'm not talking about parenting. That's a totally different thing. But as two even somewhat mature adults, having someone try to force you through intimidating you or manipulating you or just kind of bullying you into something to do what they think you should do, it's not love, even if they're right. Because love isn't forcing, but it's giving guidance. It's letting you make your own decision and then walking with you through the consequences, whatever that looks like, good, bad, ugly. And it goes both ways. When you try to force someone to do something your way, it isn't really love. It's more for your own selfish reasons. And that selfish reason could be because I don't want to hurt so much seeing how hurt you are going to be by making this decision. Because when you hurt, I hurt, right? Love is not being a puppet master, which can be really, really hard when you see someone making a mistake that will have lifelong consequences or you see something happening in their life. So after saying all of that, let me bring it around to my statement that I can honestly say that I believe with all my heart that God is a good and faithful God. He has never been a puppet master in my life. Even when I wanted him to pull the strings in a certain way to make things happen the way I wanted him to, he didn't because he loves and he doesn't force things to happen. But he has been there for me to carry me through the darkness when I couldn't function. He cried with me. He hurt with me. And I guarantee that even if you can't see it or feel it right now, he is doing the same thing for you and you will see it at some point. So please hold on. Pain eases. There is 